you know, we talk about sometimes on a, on a spiritual discussion, we talk about going to the next level. You know, what is it like to go to the next level? And, and that's a good thing to have. It's a good thought process. It's a good idea. But before we can ever go to the next level, we have to leave the level we're on. Now, at the uh, Mercedes-Benz Dome, they have escalators. I choose those at my life age right now to, rather than stairs. So they have these escalators, and we got on them because the first night they sent us to the nosebleed section. Uh, it is almost straight up. It's like sitting on a ladder. And, uh, and then somebody, I forgot who it was, asked me, he said, uh, Pastor Bud, are you going to stand up when we worship? I said, nope, not today, Satan, show sure ain't. I'm not standing up. What I did, because when people got in front of him, it was a little more comfortable. While we were sitting there, my wife said, I'm afraid of heights. Y'all know that. My wife said to me, she said, look up in the top of this stadium and look at all those big beams. And I'm sitting there looking straight ahead, and I said, Faye, I can't. I'll pass out. <laughs> well, no way I was going to look up and then look down. The whole world starts spinning. So I wasn't going to do that. But for me to get to the seat that I was supposed to be in, or they thought I needed to be in, I had, to, I had to leave this floor to get to that floor. And so the same thing happens in our spiritual life. The same thing happens in spiritual maturity and a spiritual level. If I'm going to go to the next level with God, then I'm going to have to be willing to leave the level that I'm at to get to the next level. And that requires some changes. That requires some different attitudes, and that requires some, some different thought patterns. And, and, and before we know where to go with the next level, then there has to be a vision. There has to be a vision. In uh, August 2012, God had begun to, to deal with me as a pastor on the total direction of LifePoint Church. Uh, we had Vision Night 2012 back in August then of that year, and we met in the Family Life Center. We had a meal, and we met with somewhere around 51 people, I believe it was. Uh, some of those people are, are no longer here. Some of you are still here. You rem How many of you remember Vision Night 2012 when you were here? So you see the difference in the number. So there's about 51, 52 people there. But before then, God had begun to deal with me and show me the vision that God wanted this church to have and wanted me to push and present and lead as a pastor for this local congregation. Now, I said all that to say this. It didn't happen overnight. I pastored this church for the first 15 years and thought I had a vision thought that we had a vision for this church. We had two very long, lengthy uh, vision statement and a purpose statement, and, and, and it sounded so holy, and it sounded so righteous, and it sounded so Christian uh, that, that I wrote it, and I couldn't even remember what it said. And it was, it was really sad that I had gone that long and thought that I was doing what was right, but then God birthed vision in me as a pastor and he said this is the way I want you to go a vision is important because a vision is what God uses to direct his people into a position and a place of progress but keeping them together while they go that's a vision uh, without vision the Bible says people perish uh, there's another word that can be used from the word vision it's called division Die vision, die meaning two, and vision uh, meaning sight. So division is when there's two sights, when there's two visions, and God doesn't operate like that. Uh, the, the, it starts at the top and the oil begins to flow down, and I won't get into all of that. So why is it important to have a vision? Why is it important for God to produce vision within the church? Well, I want to do an experiment this morning that I've done back in 2012 that will show you the importance of vision. So here's what I want you to do. You've got to help me here, and you've got to do it loudly. When I count to three, I want everybody to holler out there. You know what hollering is, don't you? Saying loudly. <laughs> We're in the South. I want you to holler out your favorite color. Are you ready? Your favorite color, your individual favorite color. Now, Thomas, I want you to come stand right here, 
And Devontae, I want you to stand right over here, and I want you to face the congregation. I want to show you all something. The importance of vision. Remember, on the count of three, you holler out your favorite color. Ready? One, two, three. All right, now, Thomas, I want you to tell me what Devontae said. Devontae, what did he say? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I, I, it's a word, but we'll take it, okay? You done good. Whatever it is, you done good. Now, here's, here's the color of Life Point Church. Everything is blue. We got blue carpet. We got blue lights. We, got, we didn't do it because of law enforcement, so don't, don't, don't think that. But we, we, we chose a color for an important statement, and our color is blue. And so now at the count of three, including you guys, I want you to holler out your favorite color is blue, but I want you to holler out the color blue. Are you ready? One, two, three. Blue. Now what did he say? What did he say? You want to know why they know what they said? Because everybody said it at the same time. Everybody understands now what the color is of Life Point Church. It's blue. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Very simple. Very simple. But sometimes we confuse God to being so complex and so out there and so up above us, which he is above us, way above us, but we confuse God with, with confusing. And we think that what God has said and what God is doing is hard to accomplish. But I want you to know that God created us. So if God created us, he knows exactly what to do with us and in us if we'll let him do that. And so I wanted to simplify it for us. So why is it important that we have the blue color? Why is it important that we say that? Because it lays a foundation to understand the importance of vision. There are too many of God's people... There are too many of God's churches, and I believe they love the Lord. I believe that they want God to do something. I believe that they want the Lord to work in their lives. I believe that they want God to to work in their churches. But there are too many churches and Christian people that are all scattered, going in different directions, and nobody knows what's going on. And so God wants us to be together. He didn't send in 12 spies and say, well, you 12 spies can stay in the promised land and we're just going to let all the other 3 million people, uh, the children of God, people of Israel, just wander around in the wilderness, go wherever they wanted to go. No, he brought them in there as spies. He brought them back out. They reported, of course, 10 were negative, 2 was positive, but he brought them back out so that they could go in the promised land together. God wants to take Life Point Church to a brand new level. But in order for us to get to that level, we got to leave where we are. In order for Life Point Church to get where God intends for us to go, in order for God to get us to a place where the outpouring of the Spirit, the anointing of God doesn't only work and happen in here, but it happens out there where you live and where you work and the people you run into, then we're going to have to follow the vision. We must be willing to follow the vision that he has given us. So vision is very important, very important. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus pronounces this uh, curse on the city of Bethesda, uh, uh, Bethsaida. So he, he pronounces this curse on this entire city. When Jesus later returns to Bethsaida, he healed a blind man, the blind man that I read to you a while ago. He healed the blind man, but not until he led him outside the city. Now, now I told you to pay attention to this. The Bible told us in our text this morning that Jesus goes into Bethsaida, and while he's there, some people bring the blind man to him. And he says, or the Bible says, that they wanted Jesus to heal him. So Jesus grabbed him by the hand and leads him outside of the city. So what he had to do was he had to leave. Hear me well, we've been blessed in 2019, but it's time to leave 2019 and move into 2020 following the vision that God has given us. Now, there's some things, 
excuse me, that we find in this scripture, in this text that I gave you this morning, there's some things that leaving requires. You don't just leave because you want to. You, you can say it all you want to, but it doesn't make it reality. Kind of like the old saying, you can sit in a carport all day long, but it doesn't make you a car. Okay? So Jerry Clower said one time that one of the Ledbetter boys wanted to be a log truck, and everywhere he went, he sounded like a log truck. Bob, Bob. Everywhere he went. Everywhere he went. But you know what? At the end of the day, at the end of life, he still wasn't a log truck, right? So you, you follow what I'm saying? <coughs> Excuse me. So there are some things that leaving the familiar and leaving things behind to leave 2019, to leave the level we're at now and go into 2020 with a, with a vision and with a power and a move of God in our lives, it requires some things. Number one, it requires leaving the familiar. It requires leaving the familiar. If you're taking notes, write that down. To a blind man or a blind person, being familiar is everything. It is everything. Uh, when I was a kid, my mom and dad took in a, a missionary type person, and he come and stayed at our house for a few weeks, and he come back two or three other times, and he, he stayed at our house. And, and his, his name was Chuck, and, and Chuck was, was blind, and then he had been in a car wreck. And so he was in really bad shape, and, and Chuck liked to stay at our house. And this was the reason that he said he liked to stay at our house, because my mama didn't move furniture around. My mama, wherever it was, that's where it was. And right now, my daddy's house is the same way. If you go in and something's been moved, it's like, whoo-hoo, this is amazing. My daddy actually moved something. My mom and daddy never moved their furniture. It was where it was at. It's where it stayed as long as I can remember. Anywhere they lived, that's where it stayed. So Chuck liked to come to our house because he said, I remember him saying as a child, this home is very familiar to me. Things don't move. In fact, it can be dangerous to rearrange a blind person's home. You know what it's like, especially if you've got children. You've got up in the middle of the night to go get a drink of water, a glass of milk, a dozen cookies, whatever it was you got up for in the middle of the night, and you walk through the living room, and some kid that moved into your house unexpectedly left a toy on the floor. Have you ever walked through the house at 2 o'clock in the morning and stepped on one of them squeaky toys? That will make you claw the sheetrock ceiling. Just go straight up, right? So you don't want to rearrange. And that's, that's what it's like for a blind person all their life while they're blind. They, they see this and, or they, they can't see anything and they see it in their mind, the familiarity. And so they, they, are, they are very in, enticed to stay in the familiar. And I'm afraid that many people, maybe some of you here this morning, will never receive from God simply because they're unwilling to leave the familiar. I remember the first time we announced at this church, <clears throat> and we were not uh, life point at the time, when we announced at this church that we were going to paint the back wall black. Um, and I had one person come to me, not just one person, and said, you know, I'm just not sure about painting the back wall of a church stage black. And when I explained that it was about the theatrics, it was about pulling the attention to those that's on the stage so that they can lead and worship and, and the preaching could be more uh, available for their attention and those types of things. When I explained it, they said, oh, I see, but I'm still not real sure about a black wall on the stage. The next week, I said, well, you just pray about it and, and ask God to help you with it. And we done said we were going to do it, so we were going to paint the wall black. And so they come back to me the next Sunday, and this woman said to me, and at the time she was about 80 years old, she said to me, she said, you know what? I just want you to know that God got on to me, and it don't matter if you paint that wall pink with purple polka dots. If it will lead people to Christ, I say let's do it. So you see, the familiar says that we got to stay. I'm not putting down traditional churches. I'm not saying we've got it all right and everybody else is wrong. That's the furthest thing from my mind. But what I am saying is if we want to receive from God, we got to be willing to leave the familiar. This man was led to a place that he didn't normally go. 
He didn't normally go there. He had no idea where he was going at the time. The Bible doesn't say Jesus took him by the hand and said, I want to take you outside the city. The Bible says they brought the man to Jesus, wanted him to be healed of his blindness. But remember, that's a cursed place. And so Jesus grabs him by the hand and he takes him out of his familiar surroundings and puts him somewhere else. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't depend on your own understanding. You know what he's saying? Leave the familiar. Leave your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do and he will show you which path to take. Listen, there will be times in the future for you as an individual, but mainly for Life Point Church, that we feel like we're in unfamiliar territory. Our understanding may say, I can't see. Our understanding may say, I can't figure it out. But we got to hold to his hand and leave the feel familiar behind. We got to be willing to step out beyond the familiar. Second thing it requires is this, never returning to the cursed place. Don't ever go back to the cursed place. Some of you are sitting here this morning and God has brought you out of some stuff. He's helped you out of bankruptcy. He's helped you through divorce. He's helped you through the loss of a loved one. He's helped you through some difficult things. Don't go back to the things that brought you the pain. Don't go back to the places that brought you down. You've got to think on the things that bring you up. This blind man had no need to go back to the city. Remember at the end of the scripture that I read to you as our text, when Jesus said, I, I don't want you to go back to the city to go back home. You know where his familiar place was? Outside the cursed place. It was outside the city that Jesus had cursed. This blind man had no need to go back to the city. Bethsaida was where he used to beg. Bethsaida was where his inability defined him. Bethsaida represented what and who he used to be. So let me tell you, going back is no longer an option. Going back to the cursed place is no longer an option. Let me take it a step further. Some of you have been brought out of addiction. Some of you have been brought out of situations that you had no business being in. Some of you have been brought out of situations and relationships that you should have never, ever been involved in. And so, oh, I heard that, amen. Some of, you, some of you have been saved by the grace of God and you have been set apart from everything else you were tied up and tangled up into. And God is saying to you this morning, don't go back there. That's not an option anymore. That's not what you need to be involved in anymore. Leave that person alone. Leave that situation alone. Leave that kind of relationship alone. Get out of it and leave it alone. Don't go back to the cursed place. <laughs> Going back is no longer an option for you as an individual, and it's no longer an option for Life Point Church. The way we did things in 2019. Is, some of that's going to change in 2020, and it's going to be a good thing that we're making the changes. You can try it. You can try going back. But you'll never be satisfied. You can try going back, but you'll live in the emptiness that God brought you out of. You can try going back, but the what ifs will control your mind more than anything else. Going back is no longer an option. It's no longer an option. Number three, it requires trusting God when he uses unconventional methods to get to where God wants you to go you got to trust God when he don't do it like he did it 10 years ago you know what I'm finding out here I am 55 years old and I'm discovering over the last uh, 10 years that God don't do the same thing over and over and over. God's not repetitious in, in a lot of the things he does. In other words, let me say it like so many other people have said it. You can't put God in a box. You, you can't put God in a box. 
I remember when, uh, I, I didn't see Sister Aletha this morning. Where are you? There she is right over there. But I remember believing that when I was a young pastor, that people that got saved, I was a youth pastor and a music pastor and an evangelist. And I remember if we didn't come to church and people didn't get saved in this altar, and I wondered if they really give the heart to Jesus. But you know what began to change my mind about that was how I began to see that God didn't operate like I wanted him to, and that's a really good thing. And if he don't operate like you think he ought to, that's a really good thing. But I brought up Sister Aletha because I remember sitting in the backyard at her house, <clears throat> her husband, Mr. Joe Cook, sitting back there in the backyard with me, and he was helping me build something that had a motor on it and a lawnmower motor, and he'd done a lot of lawnmower stuff. And we were sitting there in the backyard. We had grease all over our hands. We had on old dirty, ragged clothes. And, 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 we, and there he was. And he said, you want something to drink, preacher? And I said, yeah, I think I do. And so Sister Aletha brought us a cup of, or a glass of cold water, ice water. And we're sitting there under a shade tree. And I'm in a five, on a five-gallon, not in it, but on a five-gallon bucket. And he's sitting on a lounge chair out in the yard, just this fold-out lounge chair. And Sister Aletha goes back in the house and, and I just start talking to him about Jesus and salvation and the cross of Calvary. And we were just talking about, and I, I used the motor, how the motor works together to bring power. And I talked to him about the love of Christ. And he said, preacher, do you really think that Jesus would really save and forgive somebody like me? And I said, right there in that seat where you at with greasy hands holding a cold glass of water. And right there, he said to me, I'm ready. I want to be saved. I want to be forgiven. And I stuck my hand out and grabbed him. And we prayed the sinner's prayer. And Jesus saved him in the backyard with greasy hands sitting in an old ragged chair. I'm telling you. And it wasn't long after that, probably three or four years after that, five years, whatever it was, Sister Aletha, Brother Joe was in the hospital, had some major medical issues, went on to be with the Lord, and I preached the funeral of a man that I knew, that I knew, that I knew that Jesus Christ was his Savior and his Redeemer, and I could preach that with honesty. God used an unconventional method to save a man that had been an alcoholic for years. But today, you know what he's doing? He's dancing all over heaven. He's rejoicing with the angels. He knows who's there because God used an unconventional method. Well, let me ask you. I have a drinking problem. <laughs> let me ask you something about that. Could you trust God if he spit in your eye? Will you trust him when he uses persecution to make you strong? Unconventional methods. And while you're pondering your answer, remember, he spit on that blind man then he touched him. He spit on him then he touched him. Listen, we can handle the trials. We can handle the heartaches. We can handle the disappointments. We can walk by faith. We can trust in the Lord even when we can't see. Even when we can't see. Simply because when we trust him, we know the touch is coming. Simply because that it might be hard and it might be difficult and I might not like where I'm at, but I know if I keep trusting him, he will use an unconventional method just so he'll get to touch me. Your sight might be impaired in life right now, but the touch is coming. I want to tell you we can trust him because the touch is coming. We can walk by faith because the touch is coming. We follow the vision God has given us because we know that the the touch is coming. My friend, unconventional moves of God don't mean he failed you. It means he's about to touch you. Somebody ought to give him praise. Just because it's unconventional, 
Just because it's not like we want, it doesn't mean God has stopped. I'm telling you that nothing in our life, nothing in 2019, nothing in 2020 has shot God. It hasn't moved him off his throne. It hasn't done away with his deity. It hasn't pulled down his glory. I'm telling you, just because he uses unconventional methods doesn't mean he's not loving you and it doesn't mean he's failed you. It means he's about to touch you. Number four, write this down. Moving on to the next level, leaving where you are to where God wants you to go requires being honest with God. It requires being honest with God. Somebody said to me one time, and I've said this several times, said it not long ago to a crowd of people, that people, I've always heard that, that God is not to be questioned. You don't question the Lord. You don't ask God any questions. Well, I got two children. That makes me a father. And the truth of the matter is, some of their questions have aggravated me. When they were little, come on, baby. Come on, baby. Why? Come on, baby. Come on, baby. Come on, we got to go. I don't want to. I got a video of Kayla when she was little. <clears throat> I, <laughs> what'd you say? She said, here we go. <laughs> I got a video of Kayla when she was little. And we had, and I got it just to, just to do it. I had four hens in this little 10 by 10 dog kennel. And, and I had some chicken feed. And you can, all, you, can, you can overfeed animals. You can overfeed people, right? <laughs> but you can, you can overfeed these animals. And so I would tell her, I'd let her go get the eggs out, and I would let her. Um, <clears throat> my wife didn't want to use the eggs to start with. She said, I'm not using those eggs. I said, but you'll buy the ones in the store. They come from the same kind of animal. So she would use eggs. Kayla would get the eggs out, and, and she would get the eggs out, and we were sitting there. I was videoing her, watching my little babies feeding the chickens, and it's so cute. And, and so in the video, she says, I, I want to want a little more scoop. And I said, all right, one more scoop. And so she goes and put that, and then she goes back again. She's digging in. I said, baby, that's enough. Now I'm being nice because the camera's on. Baby, <laughs> that's the truth. <laughs> And I'm being nice, and she said, I just want to give them a little more scoop, a little more scoop. And I'm like, no, just, all right, one more, but now stop, now stop. And you, you can tell when you're getting older and your patients are wearing thin because of a couple, about a year or so ago we were watching that video at home. And I said, Kayla, I'm tempted to whip you right now because I'm getting tired <laughs> of hearing me tell you on that video to stop. But this is what I found out as a dad, as a father, when my children... When my kids come and ask me something and they're sincere, there's never been one time that I've turned them away and said, shut up, you mind your own business. I run this place. You don't tell me what to do. Not one time did I do that. You know what I did? Oh, they would aggravate me like I've aggravated them for all these years, and I'm going to keep doing the rest of my life. And, and I'm just, that's what God's called me to do, is that be an aggravating dad. But not one time have I ever done that. I'm not going to start now. You want to know why? Because I'm their daddy. And when they come to me sincerely, I want to be a dad that says, hey, let me help you. If we can figure this out, I want to help you figure it out. God is the same way. Listen, he is our heavenly father. He's our heavenly daddy. And when you go to him with a heart that's sincere and you go to him seeking his guidance, God's not going to look at you and say, oh, shut up and get away from here. I'm God. I do what I want to. You leave me alone. I run this place. I run this planet. God's not going to treat you like that. God's going to do you, parents, just like we do our kids. Let me help you. Let me help you. So I'm going to tell you something. If you want to move to the next level with God, we got to learn to be honest with God. Now, don't go up there telling him how to run his business. Don't run up in the prayer room to my God, you made a mistake up in here. I'm telling you right now, that preacher, this, and that person, and my husband, and my wife, my kid, don't tell him all that. But be honest with God. Be honest with God. After the first touch, watch what this guy did now. After the first touch, when, when the Bible says that Jesus touched the man's eyes and prayed for him, 
The Bible says that the man responded and said to Jesus' question, can you see? He said, I can see some, but I see men that are like trees. It's blurry. So I can't make out anything. So they couldn't run down to the local eyeglass place and fix it. Now this man could have said, he could have said, well, at least it's better than what I had. I ought to just settle for what I got. This man could have said, well, that's good enough. Ain't no need in bothering Jesus no more than what he's already done. He's already had to walk me out of town. So at least I can walk back to the cursed place now. He didn't say that. He, maybe, maybe he could have said, I'll just be happy with what I got. You ever, I've said this so many times, you ever remember that song? And some of you younger people probably aren't going to remember the song. There was an old song years ago that said, just build me a cabin in the corner of glory. I don't want no corner in the cabin of glory. I don't, I, I don't, I don't want, I'm all right with a cabin. I got one of them in the woods now. I don't want no cabin in the corner of glory. You want to know why? Because my heavenly father said that he's got a mansion waiting on me. Going to be the first one I've ever had, but I want a mansion when I get there. Had he done that, had that man just settled for what he got to start with, he would have missed his total healing. He'd have missed it. If you're praying for your children to be saved, and, and they just quit doing some of the things they've done and they get nicer. Don't settle for that. You keep praying until they come to the saving grace of Jesus Christ and they ask Jesus to be their Savior. If you need help with your marriage and things get a little bit better and, and, and things seem to turn around, don't just settle for that. Keep praying. Keep believing. Keep petitioning God. Be honest with Him. Be honest with God. Had He done all that, He would have missed His total healing. Listen, being honest with God will bring on an extra touch. It'll bring the extraordinary touch. It'll bring the capulation of everything else that you've been looking for and wanting your whole life. And most of the time, it's the one you've been looking for for that moment in your life. My friend, it's time to get out of the cursed place. It's time to leave the city limits of doubt and frustration and move into the place of God's dominion. I want to read something to you. I want to read a letter of caution from what was then the future president of the United States, Martin Van Buren, to the then setting president, Andrew Jackson, it's dated January 31st, 1829. 1829, listen to this. Dear President Jackson, the canal system of this country is being threatened by the spread of a new form of transportation known as the railroads. The federal government must preserve the canals for the following reasons. Watch this. A future president to a sitting president. Number one, if the canal boats are supplanted by railroads, serious unemployment will result. Captains, cooks, drivers, repairmen, and lot tenders will be left without means of livelihood, not to mention the numerous farmers now employed for growing hay for horses. Number two, boat builders would suffer and tow line, whip, and harness makers would be left destitute. Number three, canal boats are absolutely essential to the defense of the United States if in the event of unexpected trouble with England, the Erie Canal would be the only means by which we could move the supplies necessary to wage modern war. As you may well know, Mr. President, the railroad carriages are pulled at the enormous speed of 15 miles per hour. Not 50, 15 this is done by engines which, in addition to endangerment of life and limb of passengers, roar and snort their way through the countryside, setting fires to crops, scaring the livestock, and frightening women and children. The Almighty, talking about God, certainly never intended that people should travel at such a breakneck speed. <laughs> Sincerely, Martin Van Buren, Governor of New York. Martin Van Buren became the President of the United States. But he had no vision for the future at the time. But LifePoint has a vision that came from God, and it's simple. 
It's simple because of Habakkuk 2 and 3. Listen to this. Write the vision plainly so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. This vision is for a future time. It describes the end and it will be fulfilled. It will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently, for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. Our scripture for Life Point Church, I told you what the color was. Our scripture for this church is found in John chapter 10, verse 10. John 10 and 10 says, The thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. What is the vision and the purpose statement? It's simple. It's short. It's just like Habakkuk 2 and 3 says. It's very short and it's simple, so you can grab it and run with it. What's the vision and the purpose statement? Pointing people to abundant life. It's simple. So how do I do that? How do I point people to abundant life? you got to leave the familiar. you got to make some changes. you got to get outside these four walls. Life Point's logo. Watch this. It comes up on the screen. Life Point's logo. It's not just a logo. Somebody told me the other day, so that kind of looks like a Walmart sign. I said, well, Walmart ain't the only saving place. <laughs> Amen? Right? That carries an important, that's, that's five arrows pointing in to the center. The center is always Christ, but those five arrows represent the fivefold ministry that's found in the Word of God. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, and pastors. Fivefold ministry. It's important. It's important that you know that and you get that and you see that and you understand that. Pointing people to abundant life, the color blue. See that? It's blue. It's blue for a reason. It's blue for a purpose. Those fivefold ministries pointing in. And then the name Life Point isn't just something we come up with. We had a guest here the other day, and, and he's had to do some traveling. He said, man, I will be back. I came a little skeptical, but I will be back. He, and this is what he said. He said, man, we left the church up around Atlanta named Life Point and come down here, and it's almost identical. Man, I could feel the Spirit of God when I pulled in the parking lot. I said, thank you, Jesus. But we didn't come up with that Life Point name just to come up with a name. I don't know how other churches come up with their name, but I, I can tell you this, Life Point Church, the Life Point has a meaning behind it. That word life means the quality that distinguishes a vital and functional body from a dead body. That's life. That's what God wants for us. He wants life, and he wants you to have abundant life. And then the word point means this, a particular step, stage, or degree in development. So what does it mean? That if we're going to point people to abundant life in Christ, it means this, that we're going to take particular steps, we're going to live on a certain stage, and we're going to use a certain degree in developing people so that their life is separated from anything that the enemy tries to bring death. Remember, the enemy comes to steal kill and destroy so what is our purpose what is our reason for being here at this church why do we exist we exist to point people to abundant life we exist so that what we do not just inside the church building but outside the church walls in this community so that they know that they don't have to live in a state of mind. They don't have to live in a way that the enemy can come in and steal kill and destroy but they can have life abundantly in Christ that's why we exist. Louis Giglio, which is the pastor of Passion City Church in Atlanta. My wife and I, she followed me. <clears throat> I could get her in a lot of trouble if she would just listen to me. <laughs> there was a certain area at the dome or at the, the stadium that was marked off. And I caught the guard of the door not looking. And I grabbed her by the hand. I said, let's go in here and look. She said, are we supposed to be in there? I said, we'll find out. Telling you, I could get her in trouble. She'd listen to me. And so <clears throat> we walked in this private area, and I stopped. Somebody else was sitting there at the, at the chair that I didn't see, and I was like, oh, how you doing? <laughs> and I asked her some questions. She said, that guy right over there can probably tell you. And so I went over and talked to this guy. And he is, he's been at uh, Passion City Church for years. Uh, it's from Dothan, Alabama. He knows where America is at. And uh, I said, you ever heard of Life Point Church? <laughs> I didn't ask him that. But um. I went over and talked to him, and this is what he told me that, that Louis Giglio had, had shared with the church. He said, I want 1% of the city of Atlanta 
I'm asking God for 1% of the population of the city of Atlanta to attend Passion City Church on just going through the week. Every week I want 1%. And he looked at me and, and, and I started telling him about Life Point, started telling him about our church. And God just, I said, man, 6% or 1% of that, that's, what we say, 6 million people? Six million people in Atlanta, my Lord. Oh, geez, man, that's a lot of people. That is a lot of people. And God quickened me and said, I want you to, I want you to ask me for that. I was like, what? God, you want me to ask you for 1%? And I could feel God saying to me, son, do the math. Winning people in your city is just like tithing. 1% is 1%, 10% is 10%. And he said, I want you. Can, can you imagine God speaking to me and saying, I want you to ask me for something. And God said, I want you to ask me for 1% of the population of Sumter County. You know what that is? It's about 320 to 350 people. 32,000 to 35,000 people in this, in this county. The Bible tells us that they, they, if we'll speak it, God will bring them from the north, the south, the east, and the west. So you know what I'm asking God for? 1% of the population of Sumter County to be a part of Life Point Church. And I could go through all the statistics all the things that we found back in 2012 on the unchurched people, I'm telling you, out they're out there and you have got to go get them. You have got to go get them. You have got to go get them. You've got to tell them. Listen, you're going to have to go tell some of the people you used to drink with that Jesus has changed your life and I'm going to a church now that you need to be a part of. You're going to have to go back to people that made you mad and hurt your feelings and broke your heart and you're going to have to tell them Jesus made a difference in my life. Let me help point you to abundant life. Come to me. Come with me and let's go to Life Point Church. You're going to have to go tell people that you used to smoke dope with. Come on somebody. You used to be all up in their business. Your life used to be a wretched mess with that person or with those people and you're going to have to walk up in their business and you're going to have to tell them I just want you to know that Jesus has transformed my life and he's made a difference and I want to help point you to abundant life and I want to tell you that you can find hope, relief, joy, power and joy in your life if you'll just come with me to Life Point Church. You're going to reach people I can't reach. And that's why God gave us this vision. I'll be the first to say it. That God's been good to us. And look around. Look around. God's been good to us. But if we get satisfied here, we'll never see what God has for us. We know what God's done. What we don't know is what he wants to do. And that's the difference. And we'll never reach the people God has for us until we reach out to the people that God has for us. So guess what? It's time to leave 2019, and it's time to roar into 2020, ready to point people to abundant life. That's what we got to do. That's what our commission is. That's what our vision is. I've talked to pastors, and they say, man, tell me what you're doing over there in America. And I start, the first thing I tell them is, what's the vision you have? Oh, our vision is, and they'll rattle off something just like we had. I said, you need to wad that up and throw it in the trash. And you need to get rid of it. And you need to get in an altar. And you need to get in a prayer closet. And you need to start walking around. And you need to start asking God what God's vision for the church is. We can do more than we've ever done before. More than we've ever done before. If we'll follow the vision that God's got for us. The one he's placed in front of us. Hey everybody, this is Pastor Bud Womack from Life Point Church here in America, Georgia. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you for joining us today in this worship experience. Our prayer is that the message you've heard is relevant for your life and for today, and also that it builds the body of Christ as a whole. We'd like for you to go to our YouTube channel, click on subscribe, so that you can be a part of the next messages that come out. We'd also like to give you the opportunity to be a part of Life Point Church as we continue to point people to abundant life. 
you'd like to give and help support this ministry, go to our website, www.lifepointamericas.com. Click on the Give button. You'll be able to follow the steps to support this ministry.